Welcome to HIPAA Audits, What You Should Expect. My name is Carlos Leyva. I'm the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, just a little housekeeping item. Um, we're going to take questions as we go, like we normally do. So Martin is, is manning the chat session. If you have questions, um, Please input them into that uh, dialog box, and Martin will uh, stop me at the appropriate time, and uh, we'll take questions, and then we'll have questions at the end as well. So here's the agenda that we're going to cover today. What is a comprehensive initiative, and a comprehensive initiative vis-a-vis -vis how you should prepare for an audit? Um, partial solutions really are everywhere, and and tend to confuse the marketplace as to what's required and how you prepare. Uh, and we're going to specifically talk about these components of an audit coverage, education requirements, step-by-step -step review, and having a robust methodology. And then we're going to do uh, time permitting and uh, Q&A at the end. Now, there's a lot of material here. A lot of it uh, I'm not going to read to you. You should have uh, gotten the PDF slides. Uh, so that uh, we can actually take more questions. So the learning objectives is really to provide a foundational understanding of the requirements for a comprehensive HIP HIPAA audit preparation. And uh, the key words here are, are comprehensive. So we're going to define what comprehensive audit coverage is. We're going to talk about what is not comprehensive, key components of, uh, of coverage, why tracking where you are in your compliance initiative matters vis-a-vis -vis an audit, um, and a little bit about systems thinking, how not to chase your hip and tail as you're preparing um, and working on your initiative, and obviously the best way to prepare for your initiative, for, for an audit, is to get closure on most of your initiative. So we're going to talk a lot about requirements, um, and the requirements have been um, published uh, by HHS as part of their audit protocol, and we'll talk about what they did and, and, and really that there's, there was nothing new. So at the end of the day, we want to provide organizational stakeholders with, with a sense of how your audit preparation should be based on full coverage of HIPAA requirements uh, and what that entails from a practical perspective. So these are the three legs. Uh, we look at the High Tech Act and the regulations that were derived from it as a three-legged stool. Uh, it touches the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. Uh, those of you familiar with the omnibus rule, that really wasn't a rule. It was an update to these three rules plus an update to the enforcement rule. And we don't really include the enforcement rule generally when we talk about um, requirements because that's sort of a procedural rule. That's for your lawyer and maybe your security officer needs to understand if you're involved in a lawsuit or if you're involved in an audit and and um, you know there's certain procedures so we don't talk, we don't talk about that as far as having requirements these are the these are the three rules the privacy rule security rule and the breach notification rule that have audit requirements and these are the three rules that HHS has published its audit protocols surrounding so comprehensive compliance at, at, at a basic level means you have to have policies in place, you have to have processes that underpin those policies, and you have to have tracking mechanisms if you want to show visible demonstrable evidence of compliance and if you want to establish a culture of compliance. So you're going to prepare for an audit. The only way, let me, let me, let me, let me submit to you that the only way to prepare for an audit is to be able to show visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. Now, what we're, what we're going to talk about is visible, visible demonstrable evidence of what and at what level of granularity. And it's going to be at the granularity of a requirement. The breach notification rule has requirements, the privacy rule has a set of requirements, and the security rule has a set of requirements. And um, magically, they happen to correspond to the audit protocols that HHS release probably about six months ago. Now, I'm sure that most of, if not all of you are aware that audits are supposed to start again in October 16th. On October 16th, there's some confusion as to how many, whether they're going to be desk audits, uh, how many business associates versus how many covered entities. Um, 
all that, but sometime in October it looks like these audits are going to start and uh, I believe that uh, OCR has already sent out notifications to those covered entities and business associates as, as to who is going to be audited, but it, it's, that's still unclear. So, your audit preparation must allow you to produce and track visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement of the HIPAA rules. As a practical matter, this means you must have a clear understanding of each requirement. You must be able to show VDE for each requirement. If you currently can't show VDE for each requirement, you must at least have a plan in place for achieving same. Items two and three mandate that you have the ability to track progress at the granularity level of a requirement. In other words, you, you're going to want to show that you're either complying with each requirement or that you, you've made a good faith effort in your initiative and this is where you're at, this is the methodology that you're following, this is what remains to be done and worst case you avoid any kind of fine that will be um, characterized as willful neglect which is basically you thumbed your nose at the High Tech Act, you've thumbed your nose at what's going on over the last four or five years and the change in regulations and, you know, you're, you, you, for, you, for example, you haven't done a risk assessment. You know, you, you could probably found, be found in, in willful neglect. So there's some things and some steps you should take that would, at a minimum, uh, allow you to make a good faith argument and to try to avoid any finding of willful neglect during an audit. So it's all about requirements and we're going to get down to specific requirements um, first in the first with respect to the audit protocol that's been released and we'll see how those really translate into just the requirements that have been embedded in the rules all along and here they are so HHS released a spreadsheet it's available online and it's you can access it via um, some drop-down boxes, it'll show you all the requirements that they have listed for the privacy rule. And that's what's shown here, partly, right? So this is the privacy rule requirements, and you can see that it goes through section by section, and it's just calling out things that are just in the rule, okay? So this is, uh, again, the privacy rule requirements. And this is the section here that we call the Patient's Bill of Rights, sections 520 through 528. And you can see that sections 502 through 514 are the sections that we call uses and disclosures. This is Those are the sections that you have to look at to figure out if the privacy rule was breached. In any case, there is um, 74 requirements that OCR has listed for the privacy rule. Actually, 81. Here's the remaining. These come in Section 530 uh, administrative requirements. So there's 81 total requirements that OCR has said pertain to the privacy rule. The security rule is broken down, as you might imagine, by the safeguards. So here are, on this page, we're looking at the administrative safeguard requirements. Uh, number one, conduct risk assessment, acquire IT systems and services, and this is just coming right out of the rules, right out of, in, 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 uh, in the security rule, right out of the standards and the implementation specification. So there's nothing mystical here. Uh, what, what OCR did was just went to the rules and pulled the requirements. And, in fact, we'll talk about later, that's exactly what we did when we created our privacy rule checklist and our security rule checklist and our breach notification framework. There's no need to guess what the requirements are. They've been in the rules uh, uh, the entire time. Okay, so here's some more uh, for the security rule. And there's 53. Well, the numbers here, uh, uh, the numbers here are a little bit different because I cut and pasted the technical safeguards before the physical safeguards just because that's how I like to present it. So it really turns out to be, I think it's going to be 78. And then breach notification is just a, a, a different kind of animal. There's not so much, there are requirements, but the requirements are 
do you know what to do to analyze if there's a breach? Okay, do you know, are you aware of how to go about notifying individuals? Are you aware of how soon you should notify? So this is kind of a, a for a breach notification, more of a general awareness of things that you should know and, and things that you should do and templates and procedures and things you have in place in case you have a breach. Okay, that's what you're going to want to show to meet these requirements. Notice this is a small number of requirements here for breach notification, which is what you, which is really what you would imagine, right? It, it makes sense that this is that there's a smaller set for breach notification. So here's the total. We have a privacy uh, rule, we have 81 requirements. Yes. There was a quick question in there which will refer to all the uh, the protocols you just listed. <clears throat> Do they reflect the omnibus rule? Was the question. Do the protocols reflect the omnibus rule? Yes. The yes. The answer is yes. The, the omnibus rule. Let, let me let me go back here. See what their what their um, uh, what they're showing here are just like the the headings of the sections, one sixty four three ten, and you know th those headings. Uh, didn't really change, right? It's the substance underneath those headings that changed vis-a-vis -vis the omnibus rule. Those aren't so. There, it's not. It's not showing those here. All it's all. All they've done is list the heading numbers, right? Yeah, and yes, there's multiple heading numbers. For example, on this particular page for the physical safeguards, physical safeguards are 164, 310, but they, you know, they have different headings, right? And they're pulling. They're pulling out the uh, the standards and the implementation specifications, but it's just a heading. It's just a label. There's really uh, they, it, now that's what they've done here on their website. And if, if you Google HHS audit protocols, you'll find this spreadsheet that you can download on their website. But so yes, when they come when they come to audit, they're going to audit based on the omnibus rule. But that's clear. Any any other questions? Um, while the, secu the security rule nor the OCR audit controls do not specifically state any requirements around email security, acceptable use, etc., where would email acceptable use, work from home policies, etc., fall into the OCR audit? Well, yes. The rules don't talk about, uh, and not not specifically, uh, you know, um, email rules. But the email rules are um, obviously email is transmitted over the wire, and uh, if you if somebody if you transmit if you use email and it's unencrypted, okay, and somebody somebody puts a sniffer or otherwise intercepts that email that has PHI one or more emails uh, that has uh, PHI in it, that's going to be considered a breach. Now just to be clear, the fact that you're using email by itself is not unencrypted email. By itself is not a breach because encryption is not a requirement, it's not mandated by the security rule, but it's it's recommended. Okay, now anybody uh, that wants to do anything uh, rigorous is going to encrypt every possible transmission they can to take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. Because if you encrypt your email, then you're then as as required uh, by the NIST protocols and the guidance that HHS provided. So that is the policy. That, that I mean that from there you derive your policy is we're going to encrypt all emails. If you don't encrypt all emails and have a breach. Then you know you're going to have a breach of unencrypted protected health information, and you're going to have to report that and answer for that. Any follow up on that, Martin? Um, if you could just uh, list where the you, the protocol down list is from OCR, or yeah, I don't just go just I don't have it. Let me see. Well, you you can you can Google that. I will provide we will provide a, a uh, URL to all participants afterwards. I don't I don't, don't want to stop right now to 
uh, to get it. It's a, it's available. Somebody could post it to the chat and give it to Martin, so he could post it to everybody else. But we'll make it available after the call. Okay. And unsecured emails allowed for records to patient in omnibus not in omnibus role. Is it not? Uh, it's a long question. Excuse me. I'm getting tons of questions. Hang on one second. I lost that one. Um, regarding email and using TLS protocol. TLS is a transmission protocol, and once the email arrives at the destination, destination gateway, it is decrypted. Is this considered a breach? No, no, it's 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 not a breach unless somebody intercepts it. Okay. Yes, TLS is the recommended protocol, right? It's a it's a uh, variant of SSL, but yeah, everybody still calls it SSL, but it's really TLS that 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 is being used as a protocol. Obviously, you you're, you're going to encrypt it when it's on the wire, and you're going to have to decrypt it on the other end to allow somebody to read it. Um, there's no there's no breach per se unless somebody intercepts it. So if you protected it on the wire, uh, well, that's about as good as it gets. I mean, you know, you're you're going to have to you're going to have to decrypt it on the other end to allow someone to read it. All right, let me move on here because we we got a lot of material to cover, and uh, I want we want to get to more Q and A because that's really the, I think the most value the audience is going to get out of this thing. Now you can go a death by one thousand cuts. Which means there's a lot of people out there and a lot of vendors that are that are pushing partial solutions, and there's nothing wrong with partial solutions. Just as long as you're aware of that partial solution is probably not going to prepare you entirely for an audit. And we want to talk a little bit about wetware versus software. Now, wetware, what we call wetware, is biological gray matter in a fixed medium suitable for other humans to consume. It it tells you what you should be doing, how you should be complying. Wetware is not software. Wetware is what you need to know in order to comply. In other words, what we're doing today is wetware. It's, not, it's knowledge transfer. It's, try, it's an education trying to uh, make uh, the audience, make you guys aware of what the requirements are. Right? And, and for some reason, these requirements have remained mystical, but they've been in the rules the entire time. So wetware is a net knowledge transfer vehicle. It focuses on education, really what we're trying to do today. Software generally is where you store and manage your VDE. Okay, it, generally the software that's sold doesn't tell you what to do. Although, you know, a lot of the vendors have some templates and things like that. It's not comprehensive because really what they're selling is software. So compliance software should be much more for it to be usable to you than a file repository. It should help you effectively manage your initiative. However, software, compliance software without wetware is really just an empty container. It's not going to solve the problem. It's just like a lot of the EHR, EMR vendors saying, oh, don't worry about HIPAA. We got this, that, or the other. That, that is, that's snake oil. You can't really rely on that because they're not, their business is not to help you with compliance. Their business is to sell software, whereas wetware is really self-contained. Software requires wetware. So caveat emptor, compliance software is often sold as wetware. And it's sold in various categories. Or you can get various solutions from people selling templates and things in various categories. They include risk, man risk assessments, incident management, repositories, automated privacy verification, security incident tracking. All these are necessary, network monitoring, but they're partial solutions. So the, the, the takeaway here is don't confuse partial solutions with something that's comprehensive that will allow you to prepare for an audit and that minimally will allow you to understand each of the requirements that OCR has listed in its audit protocol. That's the foundation. That's what we're trying to get across today. So other partial solutions, gap analysis and remediation, Reach notification, forensics, disaster recovery and business continuity, training development, social media, etc. The list goes on and on. So, 
feel good, dumbed down training if you wouldn't say it in an elevator. In other words, if you're relying on the training that you had pre the High Tech Act, that's not going to get the job done. There's too, way too many things that have changed since then. Since then. There are too many uh, uh, context sensitive things that have occurred because the world has changed because you know we live in this 24-7 always on social media enabled world, that kind of training is no longer sufficient for your staff and we recommend you can't rely on it. Right? So everybody needs to become, and by everybody, I just don't mean the compliance people or the IT people, I mean everybody, the doctors, the nurses, the therapists, everybody needs to become more literate if you're going to be able to um, establish a culture of compliance. Right? And that's really what a comprehensive preparation for an audit I used to do. So there's hundreds, literally hundreds of point, sol point solutions available. And some of them are really good. Just be aware that you're buying a point solution. Okay, I'm going to take a breath here and, and see if there's any questions, Martin. Um, someone had sent us the uh, protocol URL, so I sent it out and we received a message from um, one of our participants. Please be aware the protocol has not yet been updated to reflect the ob omnibus rule. I almost said the Obama rule, I apologize for that. But a version reflecting the modifications will be available in the future. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what that, what that means, but we can have a little Q&A on, on, on that. Because to, to my, uh, uh, the, the way those protocols are, are, like I said, they're just headings. So the omnibus rule changed the substance underneath the headings. And that's, I don't believe, maybe in one or two rare occasions that are not omnibus rule add a new heading. You know, there may have been one or two, but uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, I think th these are the requirements. Um, we can explore that a little bit. Okay, education is really foundational, right? If you if you're if you're searching for a place to start, educating your staff on the new regulations and reach notification and all the things that have changed in SciTech is uh, is a great place to start. It's, 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 you can at least point, if that's all you've done, you can at least say, hey, we've gotten started. That alone might allow you to make a good faith argument. That plus a risk assessment may allow you to make a good faith argument. What would you educate your staff on? What's changed? Well, the High Tech Act changed everything, right? And the omnibus rule was really a, a uh, rulemaking that the High Tech Act mandated. That's what the omnibus rule is. It's not a rule by itself. It's just changes to the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule, and the enforcement rule. That's what that 500 page PDF is all about. Obviously, High Tech Act changed the privacy rule, changed the security rule, uh, changed, introduced breach notification rule because it didn't exist prior to the High Tech Act and has had significant impact on business associates, how they have to comply, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the major areas where um, training is required. Now, prior to, let me just put this out there, prior to the High Tech Act, the dirty little secret in the healthcare industry that everybody knew that HIPAA was an unenforced paper tiger. Nobody was doing risk assessment, nobody was doing much more than having their notice of privacy practices signed. Why? Because there was no enforcement. That's all you really needed to do and you could have your feel good training and Everybody could say, yeah, we're compliant, there's nothing to worry about. The High Tech Act changed all that. Breach notification changed all that. Uh, and so now you have a lot more training to do, training around risk assessment, around risk management, around social media, mobile, cloud computing, et cetera, et cetera. So post High Tech Act, more compliance literacy is required by everybody, by everybody. I mean, Chief security officers, privacy officers need to get a lot smarter. Staff needs to get a lot smarter. It's just, you know, train, train, train is a great place to start. Okay, now the requirements. Now we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about some of the products that are available in the HIPAA Survival Guide store because we took a we took a requirement approach from the very beginning. And if you look at our checklist. There are three of them, and there's a breach notification framework, but there's a privacy rule checklist, which we're looking at now, an example. There's a security rule checklist. There's a cloud, social media, and mobile checklist, and 
there's a breach notification framework. Now, the cloud social media mobile is really a subset of the privacy and security rule in more depth because there's context specific things that you need to deal with if you're in the cloud social media mobile world and nowadays everybody is in the mobile world and most everybody is in the cloud social media world so here what we're looking at is what we call checklist items now these checklist items in our privacy rule checklist map to the requirements so violation of the rule just as an example this is privacy rule uses and disclosures UD requirement number one this item addresses sanction and training issues surrounding a determination of whether the rule has been violated now for each checklist item we provide a policy statement this is just a description we provide a set of processes that you should implement to deal with that requirement and we should provide a set of tracking mechanisms recommended tracking me mechanisms to capture data around that requirement so you have the policy the process and the tracking mechanism recommendations all at the requirement level okay and these map to OCR's protocol except we've condensed we condensed a few where they had they repeated a heading maybe four or five times we chose to condense that and treat it as one requirement and, and, uh, and instead of five and so th this is now the uh, patients bill of rights uh, requirements under the privacy rule the administrative safeguards uh, uh, rights under the privacy rule workforce training uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so we, we it, so we took that requirement approach the same thing is true for the security rule okay and the security rule you know is is um, is a different animal because the security rule has the one thing that everybody has to do in addition to education if you've done education and you 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 can say that you've done a a um, methodical risk assessment you're probably on your way to avoiding any sort of willful neglect fine if you don't have a risk assessment in in place uh, you're almost sure to get a a, a willful neglect fine and I, I really was surprised that there was a, a question presented to uh, the director of HHS at the HIMSS privacy and security gathering I wasn't there but I read it as to whether you really need a risk assessment before um, before an audit and I think the uh, I, I think the HHS director was probably in somewhat of, of a shock that that question was even asked because you, you know you don't have a risk assessment and they could do that on a desk audit they could determine that on a desk audit just send us your risk assessment results and if you don't have that you're going to be in willful neglect so uh, anyway here's the approach here's the approach and in the PDF you could go out to our privacy rule and security rule checklist again we're using this as an example to say this is coverage at a requirement by requirement level for the privacy rule for the security rule. If you're looking for if you're looking for solutions out there, which I'm sure many of you are, you need to be looking at the granularity of requirements. And you, the great place to start is the OCR protocol because that's what they've done. They just took the requirements that were right out of the rule. They didn't create anything new. They just took those requirements that were right in the rule and listed them and, and said yes this 179 things those are the things that you can get audited on okay so we're going to go through these pretty quick you get the idea we took a requirement by requirement approach on the breach notification framework we took an educational approach what triggers breach notification well one thing that triggers breach notification is the first thing that triggers breach notification is was there a violation of the privacy rule if there's no violation of the privacy rule there's no breach okay but how do you determine whether or not the privacy rule has been violated well you look at sections 502 which is a general rule through 514 and those are the rules that's the section of the privacy rule that you look at to try to figure out if the particular use case was permissible under the privacy rule okay so understanding whether breach notification trigger is triggered really starts with a, a, a fundamental understanding of the privacy rule. Without that, you can't really even make an educated guess. 
as to whether uh, a breach would have been triggered. Now, there's other parts of it, right? So breach notification, is, breach is, you know, it's a breach if it's um, a violation of the pri privacy rule of unsecured protected health information and no exceptions apply, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the starting point. So you need to understand that. That's where you would start. What triggers notification? What are the timelines related to notification? What's the content that you should have in your notification letter for the individual, for HHS? Um, in the case of HHS, it's really it's a letter, but it's a letter that you post on their website. To the media, if enough, uh, if the number requirements are met within a particular jurisdiction where you have to notify media, uh, et cetera, are you tracking incidents? Can you show, for example, if an auditor asks, tell me about your incident management systems, how do you track incidents? And you have that deer in a headlight look because right now you're not tracking incidents. People in your organizations don't know, and your organization doesn't don't know where to report an incident. You don't log each incident, and an incident is just um, an attempted breach. It's an incident. I mean, it's not a breach, right? Because maybe you, maybe you're using um, encryption in the appropriate way, but you should log it and analyze it. But the bottom line is this is fundamental. If you're not tracking security incidents, how on earth could you report a breach? That's You're probably going to be found in willful neglect if you don't have that basic requirement in place. Okay, so these this is so the so that's how you're going to get audited around breach notification is are you literate as to what the requirements are? Are you doing the right things regarding breach notification? Essentially, would you know a breach if you saw one? Are you tracking incidents? Are you prepared for notification, etc.? Any Martin? Any questions here? Uh, just one about um, uh, email. Actually, two. There's emails. Omnibus rule allows unsecured email records with explanation to a patient. Is it not, or does it not? I guess is what it's supposed to say. No, the omnibus rule doesn't. Is the omnibus rule didn't change anything that I'm aware of regarding regarding emails. Okay, it, 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 it emails e emails uh, for some reason are, are really complex to people, but you know the it, it, they, they really shouldn't be. Just the fact that you send an unencrypted email with PHI in it to a patient is not a breach. Okay, it's not a breach. The omnibus rule didn't make it a breach. It didn't change any of that. What's a breach is if somebody intercepts that on the wire, and then it's unencrypted. Then you then you got a problem, right? Because you didn't encrypt it. Now you can't take advantage of the safe harbor. But until somebody intercepts it, so let's say you've been sending unencrypted emails for five years, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and not one of them have ever been intercepted. Then you don't have a breach. But let's say that next month. Um, or in the last two weeks, you've had a hundred thousand intercepted because somebody put a sniffer on your wire and was able to capture that. Now you got now you got a hundred thousand emails that have been compromised. Now you have a breach. Okay, so you want to avoid a breach when you send things over the wire. Encrypt the wire using TLS. The omnibus rule doesn't speak to emails one way or another. As far as it didn't change. It didn't change those requirements. It didn't make it didn't make uh, encryption mandatory. It didn't really speak to anything about that. These are these are the confusion lies. It's, that's a great example because the confusion lies that many people didn't understand the, what the requirements were to begin with. So if you don't have a foundational understanding of the, of the requirements, you really don't know what the omnibus rule changed because you don't know what it was to start with, right? So that that's that's the that's the challenge here is understanding the requirements. And obviously, a great way to do it is you can go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide website, and we have all the rules and regulations and the statutes out there in like a Wikipedia format where you can actually click on it and look at the source code of the requirement for each one of those that OCR said was a requirement. You can go out there and look. Okay. Um, another question, Martin. What is your recommendation as to how you address in policies and procedures area that are covered by HIPAA and a more stringent state regulation? Do you recommend a HIPAA policies and procedures with exceptions identified within it, 
or do you recommend a separate HIPAA required policies and procedures and state stricter policies and procedures? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Let me let me um, um, let me address it this way. The the approach that we took, and I know some of our um, competitors have done other things out there. Uh, some of them have like for the privacy rules. Some of them have policies like in fifty different documents. They you know, and it was I, I mean. I looked at some of those approaches and I said, "This is really nuts. It's crazy. Why do you need, why do you need so many, you know, policies for the privacy rules?" So we we take everything out of our privacy rule checklist. Every one of those policy statements that are tied to a requirement becomes part of the policy, and we group all those together. And therefore, you have one policy statement, one policy for the pri for your privacy rule. Okay, one policy document for your security rule. So. Um, what you would do then is, since you have one document, take those places where the state law is stricter and, and put them in the right section so that you end up with one policy that covers both HIPAA and pertinent state law. One policy document, right? And you do that, you could do that both for the, uh, uh, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. So you should have three policy documents. In fact, we sell those policy documents as standalone documents. If all you want is the policy document, we've pulled it out of the checklist and put it out there and you could take that and then make it, make an, in the appropriate section add the state law that's pertinent to that section that makes it stricter. And so, you know, you have less to manage. You have three documents or four documents to manage. You know, if you if you you could have one and, you know, a different one for social media and et cetera, et cetera, but you don't have a hundred different policy documents. Okay. Do business associates have to have a risk assessment perform risk assessment performed? What about attorneys that represent a doctor's office or an attorney that specializes in personal injury or malpractice? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. If you're a business associate, you now have to comply with the security rule. You have to have risk assessments. The answer, the answer is yes. Especially um, now. You know, a, 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 an attorney just because he's an attorney and practices personal injury and uh, requests medical records from a uh, a provider doesn't make that attorney a business associate or provider. That's that's they're just doing their job. You know, and they're just litigating, and this has been you know uh, this has been thing, something that personal injury and malpractice lawyers do you know have done since the beginning of time, right? I mean, so what makes somebody a business associate is if they're performing a business function on behalf of a covered entity that requires access to the covered entity's PHI. Litigation is going to be an exception because you're not performing, because that lawyer who's a personal injury lawyer is not performing a business function on behalf of the covered entity. In most cases, he's probably going to try to sue the covered entity. So he's not a business partner. But our attorneys, uh, um, um, CPAs, consultants, all those uh, types of um, business partners that a covered entity might have do qualify as business associates if, as part of the business function they perform, they have access to PHI. And uh, there is nowhere in high tech, in the omnibus rule, uh, in the HIPAA regulations that have any sort of requirement for a HIPAA light implementation, and what I mean by by a, by a business associate, what I mean by that is, is if you're going on site and looking at, if you're going on site and you're looking at PHI at the covered entity's office, if you're a consultant, a lawyer, you probably have less um, obligations with respect to your security rule implementation because you're actually not hosting the PHI. Right, all the physical safeguards, security safeguards, those are all would, would be really part of what your business partner, the covered entity, is doing. The minute you start taking, now you still have to comply. You still have to go through the security rule. You're still on the hook. There's no, there's no exception. No, 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 no HIPAA light, high tech light for. But as a practical matter, business associates that host and get PHI from the covered entity those are the ones that probably are really at risk for being audited, at risk for a major breach, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, uh, and obviously that happens a lot in, in all kinds of different use cases, 
for billing, for you know, you, you name it, what, what kind of services now are outsourced, all those business associates now have to comply with the security rule and they absolutely have to have a risk assessment. There's no distinction between how a covered entity applies, uh, complies with the security rule and how a business associate complies. They both have to comply with the entirety of the rule and the privacy rule and the breach notification rule. You know, the one exception is that business associates don't notify patients, the media, or HHS, it's always the covered entity who provides notification. Let me get through some of this and we'll, we'll, we can take some more questions. So uh, step by step, okay, uh, let me back up. Yes. I just wanted to point out one thing. Although the uh, HHS OCR protocol audits are not updated through the HIPAA or through the omnibus rule, all of our products are. Just thought I'd make that a, a point. Okay. Um, step-by-step -step guidance. So earlier I referred to a checklist item and you saw some descriptions. Here's an example. This is like the top upper half of a checklist item. This is privacy rule, uses and disclosures, requirement one, violation of the rule. Here's a description. Here's the reference to the rule, to the section uh, of the regulations that it applies to. Here's the policy statement. And this is the policy statement that when we take all these checklist items and pull it out, that becomes our privacy rule policy in one document. Here's some processes that you should implement in order to underpin the policy. And here's some tracking mechanisms that we recommend to capture process results. So each checklist item addresses the policy, the process, and the tracking mechanisms, those three components of our compliance equation. You have to have policies, you have to have processes that underpin the policy, and you have to have tracking mechanisms. And this is what you should show HHS at a requirement by requirement level to show that you're in compliance. Now obviously, you're not going to get, if you're just getting started, you're not going to get in compliance in day one, two, three, or four. It's going to take you six months to a year. It's going to be a work in progress for a very, very long time time, but at least you want to show, be able to show HHS or court of law what you've done, that you're making a good faith effort to comply. Again, the goal being, the objective being to avoid any willful neglect type fines, start at $50,000 $50, per uh, violation if it wasn't remedied, or $10,000 if you discovered it on your own and you remedied it, the, the violation within 30 days. I, 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 I submit to you that most willful neglect violations are going to start at the 50,000 level because people aren't rigorous, most organizations now aren't rigorous enough at, at the requirement level to catch it. Um, so same thing is true for the security rule. This is just the example before was a, a privacy rule checklist item. This is a security rule checklist item. In this case, it's a risk assessment. So we've broken it down by 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D because we follow the NIST uh, recommendation protocol for a risk assessment. Again, step-by-step -step instructions as to how you should go about doing a risk assessment to comply with the rule. And we provide some tools and templates and spreadsheets and things like that so you're not starting from scratch. You look at this blank piece of paper saying, oh my God, what? how am I ever going to get through this um, assessment? In breach notification, this is a, a, a this is a uh, one of the flowcharts, one of 12 or 14 flowcharts that come out of our breach notification framework that helps answer the question, in this particular case, was PHI secured? And it turns out when you get into the detail, it, it's not such a, uh, like anything else in HIPAA, there's more there than meets the eye. It, it, whether PHI has been secured according to the NIST protocols, the recommended protocols, is going to depend on whether you did the right thing for PHI that was at rest or PHI which is in motion and then PHI in motion we talked about a little bit about is is the email scenario where you're, you're sending PHI across the wire or was it um, PHI disposed right there's lots of uh, rigorous things that you need to do to actually dispose of media in a way that will destroy the PHI absolutely guarantee that the PHI is destroyed and, and uh, I mean a lot of people have gotten caught with copiers that take images of data and organizations want to donate these to charity and they didn't understand that 
that the copier itself was taking images, and so all this PHI now is in the copier, and you just let it go, and you know, 200,000 records just walked out and, and were found by someone else. So that's that's um, if you want to meet the breach notification requirements, this is part of the education. Do you know what to do for PHI in its different states? Do you know what to do when, when you're looking for a security rule violation? That's what our, our breach notification framework tries to walk you through at the requirement level. Now tracking is obviously an important part of an initiative. If you can't, and this goes back to the um, the old expression in, in management circles, which is becoming more and more true every day. It's always been true, but I mean, it's just more and more appropriate to so many other things that we do from a business perspective, and, and that is you can't manage what you don't measure. If you don't know where you're at in your implementation, in your compliance initiative implementation at the requirement by requirement level, then you can't actually make a good faith argument because you don't even know the status of where you're at. So what we've done for our checklist is to provide a scorecard. We list all the requirements and you can put a zero means we haven't gotten started on this one at all. Uh, a one means you, you know we've this is on a plan. We haven't we haven't done it yet, but we recognize we need to do it and and so it's a it's a it's a one. If you've gotten something basic in place, it's a two. And then you can add up your score and say hey, this is kind of where we're at right now. You could use this for your own internal reporting to management. You could use it to report to HHS because now you have a mechanism, a methodology to track where you're at. And that means that that is by itself lets HHS know that you have some kind of rigorous methodology and program that you're following in order to get to comply and that you're doing it at a requirement level, the level of granularity that now OCR has made clear it's at the requirement level. That's the level that we're tracking. This by itself may help you avoid a finding of willful neglect, right? So you, you trained your people, you got started on your uh, risk assessment, you're calculating where you're at so that therefore you can report where you're at. Now you're on your way to um, establishing, you're not there yet, but you, you're demonstrating that you, you, you've made a good faith effort to launch your compliance initiative in an appropriate methodical way that over time will get you to full compliance. So the scorecards are available for the privacy rule checklist, security rule checklist, and cloud social media and mobile checklists as well. So in, in breach notification, again, it's a little bit different because really the requirements here were all about education, 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 but we've already talked about this. One, one question an auditor is guaranteed to ask is, you have a breach notification system in place, which means, all right, are you law, which means this, are you logging security incidents? That would be step one. Are you analyzing each security incident? That would be step two. Step three, would this, the third question would be, well, tell me how. How are you in, how do you go about analyzing each incident? What's your process? You know, how do you capture? Where's your incident document? Right? These are the kinds of things that you need to have in place to show HHS OCR that you're complying with the breach notification rule. Okay, I'm going to stop here. We take some questions. Okie dokie. Uh, can a covered entity use the BAA to require the business associate to notify the media when a breach is encountered? Yes, you can. You can outsource. You can outsource. Um, you can delegate the notification. And and if you were going to delegate the notification, you would more than likely want to put it in the business associate agreement. Now the the business associate agreement, and hopefully everybody's gotten their business associate agreements updated because uh, this month they expire. Right now they, they actually if if your business associate agreement wasn't high tech ready in September 2013 then it already expired. You were already um, 
violating. But if you had a high tech ready business associate agreement in September 2013, it just wasn't omnibus rule ready, then the omnibus rule gave everybody a year. Grandfathered in those pre omnibus rule, post high tech BAA agreements gave everybody a year. Well, that year is expiring this month. Right, so everybody should have updated, omnibus rule updated business associate agreements in place. But a business associate agreement at the end of the day is really just a contract between two parties. It's a contract that has some special, uh, specialized language in it based on reg regulation. Right, the regulations specify that you must have certain language in your business associate agreement. But beyond that, it's really just a contract between two parties. And anything that you put in uh, a contract between two parties is um, you can put in a business associate agreement, right? So you could define your entire business relationship. And in fact, HHS encourages that because why would you have three or four different contracts with a business partner if you could have it all in one comprehensive contract? It's just easier to manage that way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you could, uh, in fact delegated I, I you know I, I, I unless unless a business associate that's their business to help you notify if you're just a business associate that manages billing or the revenue cycle or you know the, the hundred other things that business associates do on behalf of a covered entity if I'm the business associate or I'm the attorney for the business associate no way am I agreeing to be notified on your behalf that's just a way for a covered entity to pass on significant costs to the business associate. Now, you know, maybe an unsuspecting, an unsuspecting business associate that isn't literate enough to know what's 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 just been handed to him may agree to that. But I seriously doubt that most business associates are gonna um, are gonna sign any contract that says they're responsible for notification because notification is where a significant amount of the cost lies when you have a breach. Okay, next question. Within the HHS audit protocol list, what does it within the implementation, I, I think it means what does it mean, within the impl implementation specification column as noted as NA versus required? This may be what is somewhat as confusing. Well, I'd have to go, I'd have to go back and look at their I haven't looked at that spreadsheet in a while. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that NA means not applicable, and you know, but, but that would be a um, that would be a strange way for uh, HHS to have noted it. Because, for example, if they were talking about the security rule and they were talking about addressable versus required implementation specifications, to put NA for an addressable implementation specification would be a complete misnomer. That would be a screw up because it, it would be adding to the confusion that people already have about something that's addressable within the security rule. Something that's an addressable requirement or specification in the security rule doesn't mean that you can ignore it. Here's what it means. It means you either have to implement it as is, okay, the specification, either implement it as is, implement a reasonable alternative. Okay, and document why you implemented a reasonable alternative. And if there are no reasonable alternatives available, you must have a compelling reason that you document why you chose to do nothing. Okay, that means that you have to look at every addressable specification. You just can't skip it. It's just not. It doesn't mean not applicable. It means implement it or implement an alternative or you better have a damn good reason why you didn't do it that's what it means so don't don't be misled by something that's addressable uh, in the security rule implementation okay it's not addressable if you go read the security rule you will discover that it's not addressable because that language that I just paraphrased is in the rule so hopefully um, uh, HHS did not go put NA for a a uh, security rule implementation that's addressable because that would be a, a complete misnomer. How long will good will a good faith effort fly before auditors expect a full compliance to be to be achieved? 
Well, I mean, look, that's going to be on an instant by instant basis. They're not, you're not going to, you know, if they audit you now and they find all these things that are deficient and they, they tell you via a corrective action plan to get these things done in six months and they follow up in six months and you haven't done it, then your good faith effort is done, right? That's gone. It's good faith effort is, you know, yes, how long? Well, it depends, you know. It, it, yeah, Ten years from now, if all you if all you've done was train your people and have a risk methodology and you've had 10 years, you know, maybe then it's not going to be a good faith initiative at all just to have those minimum things. That, that, that's going to change over time. That's going to be a flexible standard. Do we have to renew our BAA every year if they are already omnibus rule updated? No, there's no requirement that I'm aware of that you renew just to renew. Uh, a lot of people think uh, take that approach because, you know, um, they feel like it's CYA to do that. I, I mean, you have to renew these agreements when, when the law changes, when something in your environment or your relationship with the other party changes that mandates a renewal, then you have to renew. But there's no per se rule that you have to renew on a yearly basis. If nothing's changed, I don't see why. Uh, and, and I don't know, and I'm unaware of any requirement that would mandate that. Let me continue on here so we can get uh, closure on the slides, and then we'll have about a half hour to take more Q&A. So a methodology. I'm just going to talk a little bit about agile versus heavyweight. Okay. Now navigating, as you all know, it's partly why you're you're attending this webinar. Is navigating navigating the regulatory maze has proved daunting. For organizations of all sizes, okay. Now that HIPAA is really no longer a paper tiger, you have this regulatory maze that you have to deal with. But in essence, most projects fail because of people and process challenges. Your biggest challenge in implementing a comprehensive audit preparation initiative or a, comp a compliance initiative is going to be your organization itself. You're, you don't have enough budget. You don't have enough staff. You can't get your people trained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a security, a security rule implementation, a, a privacy rule implementation, breach notification, they're all really change projects. Okay, and what Agile is, and we've taken an Agile approach, an iterative approach, because you're not going to get there uh, over time. You, you, you want to continue to, you want your story to continue to get better and better and better over time, right? So you're good, so uh, going back to the prior question, so that your good faith argument continues to get better and better and better over time, even though you may not be in full compliance. So. An agile methodology addresses that because it's an iterative methodology. Methodology, but what exactly is agile and compliance? And it's just a group of methods based on an iterative approach. That's you know that's the basis of it. And iterating, getting started, is the most important thing you can do. I'll let you guys read the rest of this so we can get to uh, to more Q's and A's. But fail forward fast is is a concept and idea that Tom Peters, the management guru, introduced. 25 years ago now, right? And, and it, what it means is get started, make some mistakes, fix those mistakes, move on to the next one, and, and fail forward fast. As as uh, counterintuitive as that may seem, agile has that built into it. Why? Because this is the only effective way of solving a wicked problem. And here, by wicked, we don't mean evil. Although, you know, a lot of people think HIPAA is evil. I thought it was evil the first time I looked at the rules. So, but we mean wicked as in hard, difficult problem, right? And a wicked problem is one that has social organizational complexity. And I will submit to you that that your compliance initiative, your HIPAA high tech compliance initiative, has more organizational complexity than technical complexity. Yeah, there are some areas like a risk assessment that are highly technical in nature. But if you had the budget, you can find the right partners, you can find the right tools, you can solve those problems. It's much harder to solve the organizational problem, and it's even harder when you don't understand what the problem is until you started developing it. You may not understand what the requirements are until you really get into it. There's no stopping rule. Since there's no definitive problem, you're not quite sure when you're done. Solutions aren't right or wrong, they're just better than others or good enough. Okay, so that's the challenge when you're dealing with your compliance initiative. It turns out, though, that big problems require many small solutions. And again, that's just another way of saying you're going to have to iterate your way to full compliance. So this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to form a committee to name a committee to study the problem to death. That's going to get you nowhere over the next two or three years. Nowhere. Just get started. Heavyweight compliance is the old world compliance, focused on well-defined, 
what we would call tame problems. You had governance, and you had compliance, you had risk management, you had this formal sort of academic approach to compliance. But it was a static model, it wasn't an iterative model, it was a linear model. And the difference here is the difference between building bridges. Now we know how to build bridges. We've been building bridges now for thousands of years. The building a bridge, we understand the physics of it, the um, the engineering calculations required, et cetera, et cetera. We know how to build bridges. It's a tame problem. Whereas an organizational problem, a wicked problem, we you know, organizations are struggling with, right, how to implement their compliance initiative because it's got not only technical complexity, it's got a ton of organizational complexity around it. And that makes it even a, a harder type of problem to solve. So What's going on here? The pace of innovation is accelerating. Everybody's competing in time. There's more risk related. You just heard the latest uh, community health system, 4.3 million uh, records breached by um, attackers from China. You have uh, organized crime getting involved. I mean, next uh, next month's w webinar, we're going to we're going to tackle the changing threat landscape and why breach notification remains the 800-pound gorilla. You're going to hear a lot about the changing threat net, uh, landscape and what companies are going to have to do in order to respond. But there's a lot of disruption happening in the healthcare uh, industry, as you all are aware. Right, electronic health records, patient portals, patient performance, ICD-10, the Affordable Care Act, quality measures on and on and on. So the industry is seeing about 150 years of change in five. Now, it turns out that this, this, this is probably good if you're trying to create a new initiative because you can tie your compliance initiative to all this change because your change, your compliance initiative is going to have to evolve with these changes. And if you have mergers and acquisitions, you're going to have to then, you're going to have to then uh, sync up what the compliance, in the, your various compliance initiatives. There's just so this is a good time to introduce um, an iterative compliance initiative because the the amount of disruption that's occurring in the healthcare industry is requiring iterative solutions in other aspects. Like for example, paper performance is going to require big data and data warehouses and analytics and things like that. And organizations are going to have to iterate their way through to solutions that use big data analytics to manage population health. Right? That's the kind of nature, that's the nature of the business model change that's going on within the healthcare industry. I would say you should couch your agile compliance to be as, as part of that so that executives understand that this is part and parcel of all the change that's going on in the industry. And here are some uh, innovation curves that show that really the healthcare industry, because it's becoming more competitive, everyone's trying to get on the next innovation curve. If you don't get on that next innovation curve, you eventually go into a desperate spiral like IBM did when Microsoft kicked its butt and it had its near-death experience, like print magazines have done since the advent of the web. Right? So it behooves you to tie your compliance initiative into this um, and recognize that it's part of this other change that's going on within the industry. So a, a heavyweight compliance would be try to understand everything about every requirement up front, test all requirements for coverage, integrate all requirements in the workflow. In other words, it's big bang compliance. It's a slow feedback loop because it takes you so long to try to get this thing rolled out. Whereas agile would say define, test, integrate, and verify, and do that requirement by requirement, but start getting some results, right? Start getting some visible, demonstrable evidence, because when you do that, you're going to learn more about the problem, and you're going to be better able to solve the problem. It's a fast feedback loop. Okay, here's some um, differences between Agile and, and Heavyweight that I will <clears throat> allow you to read on your own. Here's our uh, methodology that we, we modified from the NIST methodology. And, and this is uh, more ap more directly applicable to the security rule: assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report, repeat over and over. Because you're not going to do one risk assessment and be done with it. You're actually going to be doing a risk assessment every time, probably once a year at a minimum. And every time your organizational environment changes, well, with all the change going on in the healthcare industry, you're going to be doing risk assessments a lot more often probably every quarter, every month, every week, 
And there are some technologies out there that let you do real-time risk assessments. And that is already built into the security rule. That's built into the risk management uh, program process of the security rule. Ultimately, though, don't treat Agile as any kind of religion. Agile is what you say it is. It's how you iterate. It's how you get things done within your organization. Right? So don't get um, you know, too caught up in the methodology itself. Okay. I'm going to let you, because um, I want to get to the questions. We've created some mini project plans in our subscription to get people off and running, to get people a good place to start. And we had some terminology that we developed. A track means a set of related chunks. A chunk means a set of related compliance tasks, the smallest unit of visible demonstrable evidence. You can look at the, you can think of these as mini project plans that help you get started. Okay, I'll let you read that. It's in the PDF. Here's an example of a chunk. Disseminate model policies as part of the foundation track. Here are the tasks that you would need to get done in order to disseminate your model policies. And obviously, that's that along with uh, training is another good place to start, right? So you you, you train, you disseminate your your policies. Uh, they're omnibus rule ready. You know, you're you're getting little ticky marks as to, hey, we're making progress here. We're, we're not, you know, we know we have a long way to go, but we're making progress. Here's tra uh, training and awareness, part of the foundation track, and other examples. There's 19 of these small project plans that we uh, provide. Here's just some graphic representations of uh, how the tracks apply to a risk management program. We have track one, track two, track three, and again. Things are going to be different for every organization, so these are just examples. These are just ways to get people up and running, so they're not staring at that blank sh uh, sheet of paper. Um, now, the, you know, you may have bought into the requirements, you may have bought into all the things that we talked about. Now you're ready to get going, and still, you know, when you get started, you're saying, "Oh my God, where do I start?" So that's what we're trying to address here. We're trying to give you places to start, and you can read about the tracks. Um, and I'm going to do a quick shameless plug here. We do, we do sell in the Survival Guide store Agile educational products. We have a subscription plan, $7.95 a year. The renewal is $4.95 a year, but it's optional. We have business omnibus rule ready, business associate contract, breach notification framework, 14 or 15 training modules, and of course the checklist that we've uh, already talked about. And most of our products, if not all, have links directly to the HIP Survival Guide where you can actually see the full source code of the law. So we, we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the, the ingredients. We provide educational products you can execute on starting day one, except no substitute. Um, so now, let's take some more questions, because I know that's what you guys are looking to get into. Here in, in, in the PDF version, you can click on these and go take a look inside. If you want to, if you want to look inside our various offerings, these are uh, look inside little booklets that will allow you to do that. Okay, Martin, where are we? Well, we only have one question left. You reference email as PHI in transit, but unencrypted email can be stored, for example, in Exchange servers, PST files. Storage, I think it says false. So I believe it means vaults. Access via smart devices using Active Sync, increasing the risk of compromise. Yeah. So in that case, see, that's you know that it, you've encrypted it over the wire. But if 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 it's at rest, if it's at rest, like it would be on an Exchange server after you've decrypted it, and that's not encrypted, and somebody gets at somebody breaks in, then you just have then you have a breach because you didn't you didn't encrypt it at rest. Right? If you really want, if you really want to get the full safe harbor, you're going to have to encrypt uh, e um, EPHI across the wire. You're going to have to encrypt it while it's at rest. Right? You're going to have to do the appropriate things when you dispose of it in order to get full protection. So yes, I mean uh, that's that's an obvious point. Right? If, you, if you're not encrypting it while it's at rest, you're still exposed. We are moving our client management system to a cloud-based environment for remote employees. Is there any specific requirements that we need to be concerned with other than the BAA with cloud? Yes. With the, 
Okay. Yes. I'm, I mean, the, 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 there are lots actually, but you you, 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 you now have you now have a cloud vendor, a third party managing your EPHI, right? They're storing it and managing it, and your your remote users are accessing accessing it, accessing it. You better have. Uh, you know, with the privacy rule, the security rule says satisfactory assurances that that uh, business associate is doing the right thing. Well, if you don't ask them questions, you know, about their security rule implementation, if you're clueless as to how they're actually encrypting, not encrypting, protecting, do they use strong path? I mean, all those requirements. Now you, you know, as part of your due diligence, it's it's incumbent on you to ask these questions about these third parties. That are hosting your EPHI. That's one. Now they have to do it. They're on the hook. They're on the hook statutorily to comply with the security rule. But I guarantee you that's, that that the class action lawyers out there, if you don't do the proper due diligence, are going to are going to bring suit under state law, not under HIPAA, but under negligence. Okay? Because that satisfactory assurance language, that's those are weasel words that will allow negligence suits. To proceed if you haven't done the right kind of due diligence, okay? And obviously, due diligence with certain BAs are going to be is going to be a lot more important than with other BAs, right? A due diligence with a cloud-hosted vendor that is storing your EPHI versus the due diligence that you would do with your accountant that shows up to your office to and sometimes has to look at EPHI. Those are two different. Those are two totally different standards that you probably will be held to. Now, in addition to that, it gets worse because you need to start considering what happens if this vendor goes out of business? How do I get my data back? What happens if I become unhappy with the service? How do I get my data back? And beyond how do I get my data back, you might not even know what structure the data is in. So how are you, how, how are you going to read your data, even if you could get it back? Because any any cloud hosted uh, provider is using software as a service, which means you need the data, but you need their service to read the data. Unless you make some contractual arrangements in your BAA as to how you might get the data, and and perhaps they put their application in escrow, you you may be completely out of luck if this particular vendor um, either gets becomes unhappy, the relationship deteriorates, or they go out of business, or God knows what other kind of disaster could happen. There are a lot more risks that are hidden, really. These are hidden risks because, because healthcare is going to continue to go to the cloud because the cloud is providing compelling economics, right? So the rush to the cloud is going to continue, but there are some insidious problems that a lot of people aren't aware of as they move to the cloud that are only going to become, uh, that are only going to manifest over time when problems start to happen. Okay, so you know, I have a friend that says, you know, sometimes it rains on the cloud, sometimes there's thunderstorms, you know, so things things can uh, things are not what they seem. You have to do a lot more due diligence. Um, here's a two-part question, one of my favorites. Uh, I'll give both parts. What is the encryption standard for email transmission 128 or 256 bit? And the second part of the question is, what is the safe harbor standard for encryption of email and mobile devices and or mobile devices. Okay, so um, you know the, the answer is one, whether it's 128 or 256, I'm, I'm not sure, but I can tell you it was in the breach notification rule, the interim final rule, and you should be able to find it on HHS website. It was the NIST protocol for two, for TLS. That's the protocol that you have to uh, implement. It has to be that good or better for. Uh, e EPHI in motion. Okay, so whatever whatever that protocol says, that's 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 what you have to implement or better. Okay, uh, so if it's 128 or 256, whatever the, that that protocol, uh, whatever HHS published, and they said follow this this protocol, that's the one you got to locate and follow. Uh, we don't have any more questions at this point. Well, great. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back next month with an, uh, another webinar. It's going to be like uh, I previously mentioned. We're going to talk about the change in threat landscape and why uh, breach notification remains the 800-pound uh, gorilla. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time.